hello everyone uh, welcome to this uh, short interview series so here i have bibek he is one of my colleague from open university netherlands he is almost in his final year of his phd and i will leave to bibek to give a short intro about what where he studied before and where is he from and what is he doing now and then we'll continue with this discussion Hello, uh, nice to be here. Uh, my name is Bibek, as you just heard, and um, I'm from Nepal. Um, I'm currently in my final year of my PhD. Um, and, uh, well, to give a little bit of my background, um, uh, from an academic point of view, um, I was doing my diploma in Australia, um, and then I moved to uh, Malaysia, where I did my bachelor's, uh, and then my master's was from Germany. And I'm finally doing my PhD here in uh, Open University in Netherlands. Um, and yeah, so that's all from my introduction. Okay, so speaking about uh, your point of origin, like you have come from so far from Nepal. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the biggest difference that you see when you compare the education and your experience of uh, the Nepalese system and the system in Germany and also the PhD system in Netherlands maybe two three points which comes to your mind like in general I think there are not a lot of differences in educational systems between Germany and Netherlands uh, especially the European standards the difference that I see are usually uh, intercontinental like um, the educational system in Nepal is uh, vastly um, more factual based where you are sort of taught everything that they they want to you to learn which mm -hmm. are things like moral sciences and um, this type of things that usually not does not make a lot of sense um, and a lot of emphasis in put put is put on this sort of uh, educational uh, uh, outcome of how well you perform in your exams and not really more on your whole development and how you progress over the years in terms of uh, how you study and there's very less focus on um, metacognitive uh, learning skills and um, these type of things which are really crucial for actually the long term uh, mm -hmm. long term progress of your learning. Yeah, it's true. Even in India, they focus more on the outcome rather than the process. Like. Yeah. So, uh, in my opinion, I think it's uh, really important for uh, schools where younger people study to focus more on uh, learning to love to study and learning how to study rather than knowing uh, lots of facts. Mm -hmm. That to, in in the long run, in your career, you're not going to be using a lot of those facts. You are only going to be focusing on one mainstream. And these type of things, uh, when you learn a lot of things that are not really effective and you do not implement them, will eventually be uh, forgotten. Okay. So I think that is a very crucial difference. And I, that is also really, in my opinion, a big drawback mm -hmm. in terms of education. Um, but bringing um, Australian education system and European education system in focus. Um, Australian. So yeah. you also were in Australia, right? Yeah, because I studied I, in Melbourne. Uh, okay. I did just, my diploma, just. I just said that before. Oh, okay, okay. So um, the biggest difference in the Australian uh, education system and the European education system is uh, the Australian educational system is ingrained in business. So uh, they are usually private universities that have high focus on making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. This is why they have like dedicated student services uh, for international students and a whole, uh, whole organization and a team behind uh, the international students to make sure that they are really comfortable and uh, they are like, they got good reviews in long term. But um, this kind of also uh, tinkers down to the educational performance where uh, the international students are given a sort of a pass to do not re require which does not require them to be their ultimate best mm -hmm. because they are already paying like huge amount of fees whereas quite a bit of european universities are actually sort of cheaper and they have more standardized like standardized uh, educational quality not to say that the australian universities are not good quality of course they are really good quality as well 
it's just that the business aspect really tinkers down and um they sort of start viewing the international students are as like a money, money vending machine yeah <laughs> so this this there was this event where um there was a news about the university not uh letting the professors fail the international student so ah, this type okay. of things will eventually affect your uh learning mm-hmm. so i really think um europe at the moment especially germany and countries like austria that have usually uh free access to education mm-hmm. are more strict in that sense that the professor does not care uh what you how i mean does not care if you are paying your fees or not which is usually you don't so they are not worried about failing you or if you do not perform well or not making the exams easy for the students but so yeah i, I mean here also it's very expensive compared to the europe what you pay mm-hmm. i mean in netherlands whatever i have experience in masters but uh, in a way you can also say like uh, i mean i've seen people who have <coughs> most of the people extend their master thesis gets extended because they are not able to complete it in time and then they pay more money so mm-hmm. i don't know maybe i think like maybe professors are and i mean no one does it i'm just saying a hypothetical situation like maybe professors are encouraged to uh feel you so that you get extended and then you mm-hmm. pay more tuition fees i mean no one does it in the lens yeah. just to be but that also does run you into the risk of uh giving a bad review for the university right yeah, yeah, yeah. so if you think of it in long term in future you want these graduates to go back to their country and tell good things about the universities mm. in in that country so if everyone has been forced to take extended semester they'll most likely go back and say okay don't go to this uni go to the other one so that is not really a long term uh uh pl- long term mm. good plan in that sense so Okay. I would rather as a professor if I was one, I would rather just be neutral. Yeah, just pass them and hopefully not see them again. So, okay. Okay. Uh so let's move to the next question. Um So, how did you look for this PhD when you are doing masters and how did you apply for the PhD after finishing your masters in Germany? Um So, Uh it does take me back quite a while. Um so when I was doing my masters in Germany like in Saarland 3 3 half years back right? Yeah, four years four, 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 actually. Okay. Nearly five. Um so when I was doing my masters uh and I reached my final semester of my masters I needed to do my master thesis. Mm-hmm. So I got in touch with one of the uh research institutes in Luxembourg which is the Luxembourg Institute of Science and Technology okay and uh, they offered me basically to do a master thesis with them so that is where i uh, did my master thesis and during that thesis i actually uh, was able to publish a conference paper mm-hmm. and i went to that conference and i met ellen from open university uh, ah, over okay. here because she is my- like a associate professor currently in our university mm-hmm. yeah So my prof- my supervisor and Ellen were actually working closely together at that time and that's where I got to hear about Open University and everything. Okay. So and that kind of gave me an idea of what Open University and in and Netherlands in general was doing at the time in terms of uh, my uh, uh, expertise field. Mm, it so, was during that conference, right? Yeah. Okay. So it got me really into thinking okay I could be doing my um, uh, PhD in Netherlands which would be really great because the uh, the types of research they were doing here really inclined to what I was doing mm-hmm. so obviously um I had to look for a position in online platforms because mm-hmm. most of positions are usually uh, uh public yeah so I started looking for one and I applied uh quite a number of them I think But um when you found this then yeah uh not not exactly I actually found another position here Ah, okay. in a different faculty for which i was rejected after an interview okay um well i did reach the final stage of the interview so that mm-hmm. was pretty good but i still got rejected and then i applied again in a different position in this faculty where i actually got accepted for the position so uh, it wasn't exactly as easy as it sounds because mm-hmm. everyone has to go through a number of positions and yeah. uh, apply in a number of situations and you have to like update your cv and change your cv according Depending to the type the of position. Uh, position. so yeah. it it is a significant amount of work for everyone to get a position especially because 
PhDs here are actually a job position and yeah, it's, yeah, uh, it's, cool. it's, an app, it's an applied position. So you really have to fight for the position to get one. It's not, mm -hmm. this is also kind of different from uh, Australia where you actually pay to do your PhD mm -hmm. and you just go to the, walk into the office and say you want to do a PhD and they will just take you there. So <clears throat> that is um, so definitely Yeah, I mean, even different. in the US also, like you are like a student, so mm -hmm. it's much different like than what we do here. Yeah, definitely. So, um, and what was that duration like uh, you took? Like I actually started looking um, the moment I started my master thesis because uh, I had a good so supervisor. Was probably in second year or third year. Yes, uh, it was in my second year, last semester. So it must mm. in my uh, well in my last semester. So I started and I. I uh, gently started, had already started looking for positions, but I hadn't effectively applied for them. Mm -hmm. But when I went for that conference and then uh, I get to know all the people here and the professors and then I started actively applying for it. So I, I did apply in uh, many uh, different other countries as well, but uh, I wasn't so lucky with quite a bit of them. Yeah, so uh, that, that, that's why I've also said it many times before, if you remember then you should always apply as much as possible instead of thinking of the result that mm -hmm. helps a lot when you are searching for these kind of positions because every position has different requirement and uh, so your expertise and their requirements may not always fit and so it will vary from position to position and that's why if you keep on applying then you maximize your chances of instead of thinking that I yeah. got rejected or Sometimes you just you are just unlucky. So uh, mm. it's not a matter of if you are good enough to be hired. It's only a matter of what matches the most to to your CV. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's just plain luck because there's a lot of competition. So you have to keep on trying. Okay. Okay. So coming back to your PhD. Mm -hmm. Uh, was it based on a project funding? Uh, because in Netherlands, you have mostly all PhDs are funded by a project, uh, which is a job. But sometimes you have internal PhDs, which was my case. And I have not seen many people doing internal PhDs even when I was doing masters in depth. So maybe it is not very popular or maybe it is difficult. And so in your case, was it a project funding or internally funded? And do you think the that it makes any difference in the if you are working in a project or if you are not working in a project do you think it makes any difference in the workload or the uh, satisfaction that you get or the choices or the liberty that you have to decide in which direction you want to take your phd or what do you think like uh, mm -hmm. because you're almost ending your phd so maybe you're in a better position to comment something on that like um I was hired in a PS, uh, in a project position, of course, with the project budget. Mm -hmm. um, the project itself was the Wikid Twenty uh, Horizon Twenty Twenty project. Uh, so we'll leave it in the description below in case you are interested in mm -hmm. similar project because it is very modern, right? Like yeah, it's a pretty using... huge project where we are using sensors to basically uh, augment performance to improve your uh, expertise over time in skill based learning. Mm -hmm. So. Um, yeah, I was hired, but uh, the project was already running when I was actually hired. It was already in its uh, first year, end of its first year. And ideally, so, how long the projects are? Like four or five years? Or? Uh, usually, Horizon 2020 projects are around two to three years, um, at least in our domain. Mm -hmm. In medical domains, they go further because the yeah. budgets are usually huge and trials take longer. Um, but... Um, yeah, when you're hired in a project, you have project obligations from one side and you have your own PhD obligations um, mm -hmm. where you have to write your own proposal and write your own uh, publications and stuff like that. So the ideal scenario is that your PhD idea will exactly overlap mm -hmm. uh, the project uh, idea into a, as much as you can. So you have... That is the ideal scenario. Yeah, that you don't have to o redo the work that you are required to do. So um, in my case, the overlap was not so much um, except for a little bit of a theoretical part where I had the overlap. But if I had to put it um, in words, then I think personally to me that um, when you are in a project, you, you do tend to get a lot of 
additional work when you are when you are in a single position. Uh, not only that, when you are in a project, you are always in a huge team. Mm. So you 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 have to like learn to work in this dynamic group, mm. and then you have to you basically work based on what the uh, project coordinator wants you to do. So it it kind of becomes like every uh, collaborative group project mm. but only in a larger scale where everyone somebody does not do something and the whole project is drawn back and when somebody has a different idea and then you have to adjust and have uh, meetings to basically come in together in a single place and there are times that we have to do and redo the software and then you still have the <clears throat> the obligations to the european commission where you have to uh, submit some deliverables on your own and you have to contribute to different deliverables and they are not a part of your PhD, of course, because mm -hmm. for PhD, they don't care how many publications you do, uh, project publications that you do. Obviously, the general publications, academic publications are counted. So I feel like um, there is significantly high amount of work when you're hired uh, as a, as in a project budget as compared to when you're not. Mm -hmm. um, it also does limit on terms of what you can do because you don't have the complete freedom of doing whatever you want, even in your own PhD, because you then run into the risks of uh, doubling the amount of effort that you need to do for your PhD. And um, this uh, this does really cre create a lot of conflicts and a lot of additional work. Um, so usually I think it is good in that sense if you are hired internal uh, internally funded projects. But that said, the external, uh, when you are working in an external project, it does give you more opportunities to build your network mm. because you are working with so many different universities and so many well-regarded professors. Mm. So you know a lot of people and, uh, and I mean, when you are thinking about a career in the academic field, uh, you usually want to get these connections. Mm. It's really important, especially when you when you finish your PhD and then you have to Before personally apply for proposals or, yeah, or postdocs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you need, really need a group and a collective expertise because, um, I, of course, one person cannot do everything. No, no. So um, I think it has its pros and cons mm -hmm. in terms. But um, yeah. yeah, so in the end, like if you balance it well, then yeah, I mean, that's what I can say, like in one line, which mm -hmm. is very difficult. Yeah, to it's, the person it's, who experiences it, like it's yeah, it's it's usually a fight to balance. Them. As you said, yeah. Like. So um, yeah, it, 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 it's really about managing yourself, mm. to be honest, in that sense. Yeah. Okay. So four things that you want to adv uh, advise people who want to apply for PhD in Netherlands mm -hmm. and coming from abroad. So okay. what are the four things that they should pay attention to that? Like, um, all right. Um, if they are coming from abroad and doing PhD here. Well, let me start it in a really uh, uh, different tone in that sense. Um, so if you are coming to study in Netherlands and you don't, you can't be bothered to look into the uh, educational status of the country, to look into the university's admission pages and to read through what they want and what they uh, what they require of you as a student and you basically just go to a consultancy and say can you get me a visa and admission in one of the universities then i think it's better you don't come um, but if you are really interested on in improving your career and to to, to advance your self-knowledge in that sense I think studying abroad is more about just getting the knowledge. It's about uh, exposing yourself to new culture and new horizons, to get to uh, learn new uh, new language, to get to meet new people, especially in this globalized world these days. Mm -hmm. And in Europe, you have like so many types of yeah. uh, people and so many types of culture and so many types of uh, opportunities that mm -hmm. you get. So I think one of the things that you should really focus is to be open to new culture. Mm -hmm be ready to really put in that extra effort mm -hmm. that you need to do. And third is usually to have a plan C. Okay. I usually, uh, this I learned it the hard way, but um, there are so many factors that comes into play when you are thinking about your success. Because so is it like something like a second backup plan or yeah, plan C? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So um, you, you, you can't 
expect the world to bend around you, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. maybe you wanted to study, I don't know, like uh, aeronautics engineering, but then um, let's say things didn't go well and as an international student, you don't always have the option to say, okay, I'm going to wait it out for next year's intake and I'm going to live here until that. Maybe the visa won't be granted for you to live here or maybe you don't have the budget to continue living here and to wait for the next um, mm-hmm. intake. So you, you kind of have to be flexible and know your own status in uh, in terms of finance and all these visa-related issues so you can actually uh, be a bit more flexible in terms of what you're expecting. So even then, in, in, in such cases, it, you should also, uh, the fourth point is where I'm getting there, is that you should also know the market okay. that you are uh, throwing yourself into. So when you choose a degree to study, it's not only getting a degree and then thinking, okay, what I can do with that degree, but you are also sort of planning uh, what type of jobs this this stream of education is going to give you mm-hmm. in future and how much prospect is there. The so, demand. Yeah, exactly. So if you are looking into studying petroleum stuff's related degree and then you're hoping to get a job in a petroleum industry, then I think Saudi Arabia is the place to go, mm, not okay. really in Netherlands yeah. because they have really good uh, petroleum engineering studies there and you have higher prospects of getting the job as well. Okay. So I really think uh, students should learn to be independent before moving here because um, I personally was not independent myself before I moved to Australia. Mm. And um, I learned it the hard way. So good to know. Okay. Yeah, the, the, that's like a very enlightening uh, points that you made like... Uh, mm-hmm for everyone to know so we are almost approaching the end like two things that you love about doing phd in netherlands and two things that you hate about doing i'm just putting a number so that the discussion will be short so it cannot be two things i love about doing phd in netherlands i think usually the first thing that i mm, am really uh, thankful of of studying in netherlands is is all the social network that i built and all these really exceptional professors and colleagues that I have met and have had the opportunity to do research. And uh, outside my academic life, I also have uh, met lots of uh, friends from different uh, countries mm. and learned a bit of their culture here and there. <clears throat> so that that is, I think, one of the best uh, things that I have had so far. And I guess um, the second thing would be um, contrary to what uh others might think i think europeans are very welcoming especially in this part of europe mm-hmm. uh, for international Western people europe. yeah and um I, I i usually play in the table tennis club and all these mm-hmm. badminton clubs and um people even though i don't speak their language yeah. make significant effort to talk to you and be friendly to you and i feel like that is um really nice uh even though Mm-hmm. life here is really individualistic and quite busy so if you are open i think uh, the dutch people are quite open welcoming, yeah. and welcoming as well yeah okay and two things that you hate about um two things that i hate is uh, not really necessarily hating them on them but it's rather uh, on myself actually uh-huh. so i think i i really wasted a lot of uh, my precious time when i was in my younger uh, educational years like during my bachelor's and my diploma where I uh, did not put a lot of focus in studying and rather put focus in uh, working and earning money well it was a bit of a uh, balancing the yeah, thing I as mean, well because you, you needed that money pressure, yeah. financial pressure coming but from... now that you are suddenly are thrown into a PSG where it is more uh, performance um, mm-hmm. uh, measured and because it's paid mm-hmm. you are obliged to perform higher and then you end up thinking oh shit um, you know I should have studied this in my bachelor's, but I only passed the exam. Now I don't remember how to do these type of things. Yeah. Like, and there are so many things, especially in this multidisciplinary area that you mm-hmm. want to know and you want to learn. Everything is not possible to mm-hmm. know, of course. So these are the sort of regrets that I have. And it, it brings me back to the point that I made in the first one is like, you should learn how to learn rather than to know what to do. So. Like yeah. learning smartly or... Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, less time or I don't know, like... There are like different uh, learning strategies. Like we call it in general one time is like the metacognitive okay. level of learning. So, yeah. Um, 
the second thing I had is um, yeah, to be honest, there's really not a lot of thing I hate about this PSD. Okay, so yeah, uh, so far it's going great, except losing my hair. So <laughs> okay, uh, so jokes aside, uh, as you are already in the final year, I repeated mm -hmm. this again and again. So any single line advice that you want to give to people who are who are planning to come to Netherlands for doing a PhD? Um, yeah. So, I mean, when you're coming, planning to come to Netherlands, you can be from so many different uh, backgrounds. So I wouldn't, I would be hard pressed to, uh, to give a single, uh, a single advice that fits everyone. But, um, yeah, I mean, you can just, yeah, two, three lines, it's fine. I think the biggest thing when you're coming to Netherlands is to always focus on your career and on the long-term choices. I know that when an international student comes in, the you are really pressurized to pay your fees and... No, no, uh, um, this is only for the PhD. Oh, for PhDs. So, <laughs> when you are coming to PhDs, sorry. Um, so, if you are planning to come to PhD, uh, come to do your PhD in Netherlands, uh, you should probably start learning the language before you are here. So, uh, I always say in the videos that, I mean, mm -hmm. obviously, if you want to socialize, then you need the language, but... At least in the beginning, short period, you won't feel isolated that you don't mm -hmm. know the language. No. Like. Yeah, exactly. If you are already... I mean, it is advisable, but it is not mandatory. Yeah. But it is good for you on so many terms, even mm -hmm. in the long term, because if you continue to ah, stay yeah, in yeah. Netherlands, if you are planning to work further in Netherlands, mm -hmm. knowing a new language, uh, knowing their language gives you an extra edge already. Yeah, yeah. So... Um, I Plus, think, yeah, that's true. I mean, at least yeah. even in academics, also you need that some BKO something yeah. the certificate yeah, exactly. to teach, and yeah. for that you need that. So many things are given in their own language, like um, because they really put a focus on their saving their language. So they give lots of these certifications and uh, uh, seminars and courses in mm -hmm. their own language. So if you want to make the most out of being here, then you should really put a focus on learning their language and okay. if you are already hard pressed on coming Netherlands and it has to be Netherlands then I don't see why you should not be learning language before you are moving here okay so yeah I think okay yeah that seems to be pretty much it okay thank you very much for this uh, uh, this was my pleasure time for the people out there mm -hmm. and i hope that you like this type of uh, discussion and if you want to see similar discussion in future then we have also other phds from other universities and we'll try to arrange short meetings please comment below so that we will know what is your expectation and also comment below which part of the video you liked and what more you want to know and i will leave his uh, details in the comments below so don't bother him too much but <laughs> just uh, ask the genuine questions not like what is the application requirement those things will al already find in the website so uh, if you like this video then don't forget to smash the thumbs up button so don't forget to share this video with all your friends whom you think they might benefit and don't forget to subscribe to his channel see you in the upcoming videos till then bye see you